Uh, uh. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's start. So uh, I'm back here to to scream at you again. Um, today's lecture is on game theory and network attacks. Um, when we were actually originally writing this lecture, uh, it was just game theory and network attacks. But then, uh, doing more research, we added the how to destroy Bitcoin part because we found so many vulnerabilities with you know the the game theoretical design of Bitcoin that uh, that you know it was it was so interesting. Um, so if you are a skeptic of Bitcoin, a skeptic of decentralized tech, this is your lecture. <clears throat> All right, so. Just to start off with uh, mining pools to kind of complete the mining lecture yesterday and give you a fuller uh, view of the system. So mining pools, why do we have mining pools? It basically allows these individual miners to pool their, you know, combine their computational power together. And the main reason is so that you can reduce the variance in mining rewards. Mining pools are run by pool managers or pool operators. Uh, and basically you uh, mine at this pool and they take a small cut of the amount of hash power that you're contributing in. Some of the pros of this is that it'll allow individual miners to participate in the mining process. So it's kind of democratizing. You don't need to have a huge amount of hash power in order to, uh, to mine Bitcoin. And it also makes it easier to upgrade the network because the pool manager basically uh, upgrades on behalf of all the pool participants. Um, and that's how you can signal mining power. Though in today's ecosystem, it's a little bit more complex. There are uh, ways in which you can mine out a pool, but also specify what kind of uh, uh, upgrade you want to do um, instead of having the pool manager always decide for you. Some of the cons of this is that, well, one, you need to trust this pool manager not to steal your funds. So that's why, in general, people will say, when you're mining, like, withdraw your funds as soon as you get it. Uh, and it's centralized, which is kind of defeats the whole purpose of a decentralized system, right? Um, and once you add in mining pools into this picture, it enables a whole series of attacks, uh, game, theor game theoretical attacks, mining attacks, uh, malicious profit strategies uh, that weren't possible before. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at an example of uh, mining pools and why we need them. So suppose you wanted to start mining today. You could buy one chip of the state of the art, uh, which is Antminer S9, which costs about, you know, 2400 produces 14 terahash per second. And to, the network hash rate as of, as of today is 3.3 uh, million terahash per second. So the percentage of the network hash rate that you have with that one chip is you know, 0.004% of the network hash rate. Uh, kind of interesting. So if you calculate an expected annual reward, you'll yield that. You'll get about 3,368 per year. Uh, that's not bad, right? But the thing is, if you were to plug in this chip and just mine by yourself, that means on average you're supposed to get like eight thousand dollars every four years and six months because it takes uh, it. That's how little of the mining hash rate you total ha totally have. However, if you mine with a mining pool that has supposedly one sixth of the network hash rate, um, you're gonna find a block on roughly every hour, and it'll average out to thirty eight cents every hour, which is a lot more feasible than $8,000 every four years, because by the time that you reach those four years, your mining hardware is probably obsolete and not profitable anymore. And this is kind of a paradox in that um, the, the more secure Bitcoin gets in terms of how much uh, mining power is contributed to the network to verify transactions and make it hard to do a 51% attack, the more we need mining pools, which is a centralization pressure. Uh, so that's kind of like an issue with Bitcoin that we'll see recurring throughout the lecture today. Here is a screenshot of what the mining pool hash rate distribution looks like across different mining pools um, from last semester. And in general, the community exhibits a backlash against these very large mining pools. So for example, in 2014, uh, there was a mining pool called ghash.io that acquired over, it was starting to get over 50% of the mining hash rate in Bitcoin. And at that point, miners willingly started leaving the pool because you know, they believed in the future of Bitcoin and didn't want to jeopardize the system. Um, the reason why it grew so big was because it was so economically attractive to all the miners. But uh, there are some community pressures uh, 
making sure that 51% attacks aren't happening. Uh, I think there was a question over there. Just in terms of the profit over that time, was it like a little bit of energy costs or something like that? Yeah. Like um, yeah, so the question was, uh, what are the energy costs of running something like that over time? It's basically, uh, if, you, if you calculate that um, miners are roughly breaking even, uh, and the mining ecosystem is operating at perfect competition, that means profits are equal to losses. And the profits are simply the block reward plus the transaction fees. So that much uh, money, the amount of money that is coming into the Bitcoin ecosystem is also the amount of money that is being expended on electricity for mining. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the scary thing about all of this is there's something called laundering hashes, basically where one entity might be participating in multiple pools. And this is very uh, difficult. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to detect. Uh, you, don't, you don't know where these blocks are coming from. And the other scary thing is that the actual concentration of control over this mining power is unknown. Like, all we get is blocks of data, like solved math problems. We have no idea where the physical computers are that are actually solving those problems. They could be, you know, anywhere in the world. <clears throat> so, how do mining pools actually work? And how do you prove that you're contributing to this mining pool? You submit something called shares. So, I've been saying that oh, the mining math problem is you hash the previous block header, uh, a previous block along with a nonce, along with a Merkle root. Well, and you need to find some prerequisite number of zeros, right? So when you're finding a share, suppose that uh, a, uh, a solution that would satisfy the block reward requires 60 zeros, then you could, in your mining uh, share, maybe it only needs 30 zeros. And it basically proves to the mining pool that, hey, I'm... Uh, creating all of these shares that are partial solutions to the math problem. Therefore, I, I'm showing you that, okay, I'm contributing to uh, the mining pool. And basically, you submit these shares uh, to prove that you're spending computational power and the pool operator will pay for these valid shares. Um, and the rewards that you get as an individual miner are proportional to the number of shares that you submit to this pool. And keep in mind that valid blocks are shares as well. So suppose you uh, found a uh, solution that met the 60 uh, requisite zeros uh, in the, to satisfy a block reward, once you submit that to a pool, you're not going to get the full 12 and a half Bitcoin. You're just going to get as much as uh, a normal share because the, the deal is that, hey, uh, um, the other people in the pool are helping you pay for your shares that uh, didn't, weren't actually valid solutions. So a frequently asked question is, why can't someone submit shares in a pool and keep the reward of the valid block um, just for themselves? Um, the answer is, if you recall, like in the Coinbase transaction, that is where you defined who uh, gets the money. So if you were to change the public key of the person who gets that money, then it would change the hash of that transaction, the Coinbase transaction, which would change the Merkle root, and therefore you'd be solving a different math problem uh, than uh, what the mining pool is requiring. So then any uh, shares that you create for this alternative ma uh, math problem that rewards money to yourself is not considered valid to the pool. So this is why like, uh, the only thing you can do is really just find a valid block and not actually submit it to the pool uh, instead of making that money go to yourself. Uh, any questions? <coughs> Okay, so there's also some basic reward schemes for mining pools. The two most common ones are pay per share and proportional. Uh, pay per share, like the name implies, is every time you submit a share, the pool will pay you for your work. And this is more beneficial for the miners because the pool takes on the entirety of the risk from the variance in mining rewards. But the problem with this is that there's no in incentive for these individuals to actually submit valid blocks. You could be going to one of these mining pools and submitting a lot of valid shares, but once you find a valid block, just not telling the pool about that block, and you're going to get paid regardless. There's nothing the pool can do about it. So uh, proportional pools try to address this problem by paying out only when the blocks are actually found. And these shares are done per block. So like, let's say we're mining on this new block. Um, 
<coughs> we're mining on this new block. People are submitting shares, but the more shares there are, the more diluted it's going to get. And once someone actually finds this uh, block, then it's going to be distributed to everyone who contributed to that block. And this is more beneficial for the pool because uh, the, the individual miners now bear the risk of you know, that mining variance. Um, which is generally not a problem if this pool is sufficiently large. Like, for example, like I said, if you had a six of the network a hash rate, that's a block every hour. But uh, this is a good thing in that now the individuals are incentivized to submit these valid blocks for the Bitcoin network. However, this uh, leads to a rise of some malicious mining strategies. Uh, most notably, it's called pool hopping, which is basically you can switch between these different types of mining pools to increase your total rewards. This is because in a proportional pool, it pays a larger amount per share if the block was found quickly because you know there hasn't been that many shares created yet and therefore it hasn't been diluted yet. So the example clever strategy that would be dishonest but also more profitable is that you go and mine at a proportional pool shortly after some block was found. Uh, while the rewards are really high because your expected value of those shares is really high. And then uh, once, once those shares get diluted, you switch to a pay-per-share pool. One, uh, and uh, Yeah, you, you switch to a pay-per-share pool. And this is why these proportional pools are not feasible in practice because the honest miners who were at this proportional pool, who were you know, stuck with this pool uh, after uh, it became less profitable, get cheated out of their money from all the people that were able to submit shares when it was profitable. So this is actually an open problem. Um, designing these mining or reward schemes that are game uh, theoretically uh, compatible and not uh, vulnerable to pool hopping uh, is very hard. Uh, to kind of illustrate that, uh, here is a uh, quick splash of all the different types of uh, mining pool reward schemes that uh, have been proposed. Uh, you, you can read into this more if you want. It's just on the Bitcoin wiki. <coughs> and here are some of the main mining pools and the different uh, types of reward types uh, that they have. So it's, it's a very complex ecosystem as well. And this is usually a part of Bitcoin that uh, we don't notice as users in the network, but there's a lot of like uh, money making going on. Question? With these mining pools, the actual mining hardware isn't central. Right? It's just that they contribute to one central like, digital mining, like, I guess, entity rather than being physically located. Right? Yes, okay. that is correct. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some uh, more malicious mining profit strategies. Um, this is kind of relating to the idea that you know when you download the default Bitcoin software called you know Bitcoin Qt. Um, it has with it several uh, behaviors, like, uh, for example, you're always going to mine on the longest chain. Uh, whenever you find a block, you're always going to release it immediately, and you're always going to order transactions in your block according to the amount of fees that is paid per byte. You know, that, that is like the optimal strategy. But since it's all nodes in the network, there's nothing to keep you from trying to deviate from that strategy. That is just you know, what the network wants you to do. So once you modify those behaviors and parameters, you can actually uh, mine in such a way where you get more than your fair share of the world, your reward, and you can also do things like censor people. Uh, so let's, let's uh, dive into this. <clears throat> so pool wars. Suppose you have 30% of the hash rate. And just to simplify the math a little bit, assume each block reward is just one uh, Bitcoin. And just keep in mind that every uh, number in this uh, slide is just expected value. So with 30% of the hash rate, uh, your expected mining reward is 0.3 BTC, right? No, 0.3 or 30% of one. So once you buy more mining equipment worth 1% of the current network, network hash rate, let's, let's think about the different things you can do with this. If you go with a standard mining strategy where you take this additional 1% of hash power, you just plug it into the network, uh, at your existing pool, uh, you, don't, you're, you don't have actually 31 over 100 of the hash rate because you actually contributed to the total hash rate of the pool. So it, it's actually 31 over 101, meaning that you now have 30.69 of the hash rate. 
So your revenue gain for that additional 1% of hash rate is 0 0.0069 BTC. Now let's, now let's look at the other thing that you can do with that 1% hash rate. Suppose you were to distribute this 1% equally among all the other pools, and when you do so, uh, whenever you find a block, you're just going to withhold the valid blocks. So you're still going to be receiving a reward from these pools because you're still submitting shares. They're just being, um, uh, they're just not getting any of the reward. And the scary thing about this is this is really undetectable because uh, it's hard to get something statistically significant since a block only comes uh, once every 10 minutes. So if you do the math, you, you, uh, if you break down the, the hash rate of the other pool, 70 out of 71% of that, or 70 out of 71 is their honest hash power, and you own one, per, one out of 71 of that. Therefore, you are getting one out of 71 of all the other pool's profits, which is equal to 0 0.0098 Bitcoin. Uh, and that's really important because we have just shown that, is more, that it is more profitable to plug in your mining software and cannibalize other pools than it is to mine honestly. Uh, with the standard mining strategy. All right, question. Yeah. So, would that not mean that everybody would do this? Everybody what? Sorry. Would do this? It doesn't make sense for anybody to be an honest mine. Yeah, so the question was like, uh, doesn't that mean that everyone would do this? Um, yeah, it, it, for game theory says that everyone would do this. Um, if this isn't happening, then clearly there's some kind of social force non-economic uh, force that's like making this happen. Um, we're only going to see more examples uh, throughout the lecture. Yeah. Can you clarify what you mean by shares again? Yeah, so the uh, question was about shares. Um, it based, shares are basically partial solutions to the proof of work. Um, if the proof of work requires 60 zeros, you might require 30 zeros. And so long as you have more than 30 zeros in your solution, then it qualifies as a valid share. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and it, it allows you to attest to the mining pool that you're expending computational power for their problem. Yeah. That, that case, uh, assumes a price per, uh, payment per share uh, uh, payment plan? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, because uh, we, we assume a pay per share uh, payment plan because the proportional pools aren't uh, feasible because they're vulnerable to uh, pool hopping. OK, so there's also something called selfish mining. Uh, which a lot of people also call block withholding. Um, even the industry is very confused about this terminology because, you know, uh, cannibalizing a pool is a form of withholding the block. But in this case, we're talking about withholding a block from the actual network. So suppose you're a miner with a significant amount of the network hash rate and uh, you've just found a block. Instead of the standard strategy where you announce this block to the network and immediately receive reward, reward you can do something, you can just keep your block in secret and not tell the rest of the network. And your goal is to try to find two blocks in a row before the network will find their next block. So recall, this is called uh, selfish uh, mining. Now if you succeed in finding a second block, you've basically fooled the network because the network thinks that it's mining on the longest proof of work chain. Um, so what happens is once the network finds a block, you have your two secret blocks. You broadcast those secret blocks and make the network block invalid because the network's looking, okay, what's the longest chain? Oh, there's two blocks here. Uh, I guess I, I was mistaken. This is, this is an invalid block. So the, the key thing to notice is that while the network was working on that invalid block, you got a bunch of time to continue mining on your second block. So this means you have this free time mining on the network, which means that oh, the, proportionally, the rest of the network had less time to be mining, therefore you have higher expected profits for uh, mining using this malicious strategy. Is yeah. it very unlikely that one miner will be able to mine two blocks for the rest of the network? Yeah, well, that depends on how much hash power they have, right? So, so let, let's look at the other case. So let's say you found your uh, block, you're keeping it in secret, and you're trying to find your second block but the network finds their new block before you can find your second one. Now what happens is a race to propagate. And if you say that, oh, I have a 50% chance of winning this race and having my block be the one that's accepted by the network, this malicious strategy is more profitable, 
so long as you have more than 25% of the mining power. And if you have over 33% of the mining power, you can literally lose this block propagation race every single time, and the malicious strategy will be more profitable. <clears throat> so this is, this is uh, pertinent because if you recall like the, the graphic of mining pools, each of those mining pools maybe have like, you know, 15, 20%. It's if even two of these mining pools collude and do this strategy, uh, they're going to have, you know, they're going to be profitable and malicious. Yeah? Has someone done math on how these strategies, like what these strategies would look like on the network, and how, how much time is required for this? Could this, and, and how big is that compared to latency of just getting a block and verifying? Okay, yeah, um, there, there has been math. Like, for example, um, I hand waved all of this 50%, 33% math. Um, I, talk to me after, and I can show you some papers. Okay, so uh, we've kept on saying that you know Bitcoin is censorship resistant, right? Let's uh, reevaluate that claim. <clears throat> so suppose you're a government that has jurisdiction over uh, you know a lot of mining pools, like your China or something, and your objective is to censor the Bitcoin addresses owned by you know some certain people. Let's pick someone that uh, people in Bitcoin like because uh, they're libertarian, uh, Gary Johnson. And let's prevent Gary Johnson from spending any of his Bitcoin. So just to denote the notation, we have normal block, we have the Wrath of Mao, uh, block mined by Chinese miners, and then we have blocks that, uh, that contain transactions from Gary Johnson. And our goal is to not have any of those Gary Johnson blocks included in the blockchain. So your first strategy is, okay, I'm China, I'm going to say, all the mining pools in my country are not allowed to include Johnson's transactions. But this doesn't work unless you're literally 100% of the mining power because eventually some other miner is going to find a block and that means they're going to be able to include Gary Johnson's transaction. And the only thing you can really do is just cause him some delays and inconveniences. But let's, let's look at a more advanced strategy. So remember that you're China and you have over 51% of the hash rate. You just say that all these money, Chinese mining pools are not going to work on any chain that contains uh, transactions that spend from Gary Johnson's Bitcoin address. And the key thing is that you want to announce this to the world. So, for example, if someone who is non-Chinese includes a transaction from Gary Johnson, you're going to fork. And you're going to create a longer proof of work chain because you have over 51% of the hash rate and you're going to uh, create this, these blocks faster than anyone else. And now the block that uh, contains Gary Johnson's transaction is now invalidated uh, and it can never be published. So you have successfully censored Gary Johnson. And after a while, everyone's just going to stop trying to include Gary Johnson's transactions because they know that their block is going to be invalidated uh, by these Chinese miners whenever they do. So, this strategy is called punitive forking, where someone with a 51% majority can prevent someone else, arbitrary person on the network, from having uh, any access to their funds, making any kinds of transactions. So what if we want to censor someone without 51% of the network? You know, maybe a more realistic scenario where someone has like 20% of the network, like a mining pool does. Uh, yes, and you can actually do this, and it's called feather forking. So in this strategy, you say that I will attempt to fork if I see a block from Gary Johnson, but after a while, I'm just going to give up. So as opposed to uh, the first case in punitive forking, where when you see a block containing Gary Johnson's transaction, you try to attempt to fork forever, after this, you just give up after K confirmations. So... Uh, just to use some notation here, let Q uh, equal the, the proportion of mining power that you have. Like, um, in, for, so for example, Q is 0.2 means you have 20% of the mining power. And let's just have K equals 1. You're going to give up after one confirmation. Now, the chance of successfully orphaning the Johnson block is Q squared, because it means you need to find uh, two blocks before uh, the network finds uh, one. So it means like that Q times Q, the probability of finding the next block is Q 
Q, just multiply that twice, right? Uh, that's, and that's a 4% chance, uh, assuming you have 20% hash rate. That's not a very good probability. But what can you do with 4% chance? Uh, since you've announced your strategy, the other miners are aware that their block has a Q squared chance of being orphaned. And now they need to decide whether or not they want to include Gary Johnson's block, uh, I mean transaction, in their block. So if you calculate the expected value of including versus not including the Gary Johnson's transaction, you can see that, okay, uh, if I include it, there's a Q squared chance of not being included. So uh, one minus Q squared times the block reward plus whatever transaction fee that uh, Johnson is paying. And not including is just I get the block reward because there's zero risk of my uh, block being orphaned. So once you compare these numbers, uh, unless you, you yield that, unless Gary Johnson pays Q squared times the block reward in fees for his transactions, uh, it will not be incentive aligned and other miners will always mine on the malicious chain. So 4% of the block reward of 12.5 Bitcoin is half a Bitcoin. Uh, so, oh, this number is outdated, but basically in this, in this scheme, Johnson needs to pay about $600 minimum for a transaction, per transaction in order to have these incentives aligned for the miners to include his transaction. This is going to be a big issue. Um, any questions here? Has that ever actually happened? Um, not that I know of. Because um, I think, I mean, there's a reason Bitcoin still exists despite all of these problems. Um, Bitcoin hasn't solved the game theory, which I think is very interesting. Um, some people have tried to prove that uh, Bitcoin is secure, and that's not been accomplished yet. They, they've, I think they've proven that Bitcoin is secure if, uh, if you have no more than 33% of the hash rate. But, um, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Doesn't that mean then that Bitcoin is secure and that no mining group has more than 17 or 18%? Uh, Bitcoin is secure. I'm not sure where you're getting 17 or 18. That's the mining hash power distribution insurance, right? The no mining yeah, well, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how small the mining pools are, if enough of them collude to get over, you know, 33%, 25%, 51%, um, then you can conduct these attacks. But isn't it even more likely that such diverse mining pools will actually share a common Well, I mean, if it's more profitable to collude than it is to not, why would you not collude? Um, that's what game theory would say anyway. So the only counter argument to all of this is to say that, oh, the real world people actually care about the network. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So um, now Philip's going to talk about some of the network attacks you can do on this network, uh, on Bitcoin. All right. So uh, network attacks, where he's going to talk about how people can destroy the underlying network as opposed to just the mining uh, profit schemes that Max just went over. Uh, before we do that, we're just going to quickly recall double spend attacks. So we went over this uh, two lectures ago. Um, just to quickly like recap, you remember we have uh, Alice and Bob. Bob is like, or sorry, Alice is trying to buy something from Bob. Bob won't send the goods until some number of confirmations. And Alice wants to basically mine a private chain that she can then broadcast later that is longer and then like invalidate the history. Uh, if you look at the diagram, we have Bob sending the goods after two confirmations, and then Alice in secret builds up a four block chain that she can later broadcast. Um, and since the chain is longer, the uh, other nodes in the network agree that this is the confirmed history and then invalidate the previous Alice to Bob transaction. Okay, um, I'll show you this. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, okay, so um, we're going to now look at a, a really interesting attack called time jacking. Uh, just to, again to go over some background that we need to go over. Um, Bitcoin nodes on the network, uh, these are all the nodes, so full nodes or miners, um, are uh, essentially exchanging like money over huge vast distances all across the globe and so because each node has to be in a different time zone or not necessarily but nodes are in different time zones um, the network actually has a consensus mechanism to decide 
what the common network time is. Um, so there's actually a distinction between the wall clock time, like, you know, right now it's like 3.40, um, and the actual consensus time, or the, uh, what each node measures as its internal clock time. And the way a node measures uh, its internal clock time is essentially by taking the median clock time of all of its peers. Um, so uh, some rules that are built into the Bitcoin nodes is if the node's internal clock time defers by more than 70 minutes from the system time or the wall clock time, the node actually reverts its internal clock time to the system time. Uh, and that's kind of like an internal defense mechanism. Um, and secondly, as a precaution, uh, nodes will actually start rejecting new blocks with timestamps that are more than two hours ahead of its internal clock. So, uh, how time jacking works um, is the attacker is essentially trying to put a target node out of sync with the network uh, to give the attacker more time to mine blocks in secret to mount a double spend attack, for example. Uh, and the way the attacker does this is by launching a Sybil attack, um, where essentially they spoof uh, full nodes to set the target node's median clock time to be 70 minutes um, behind the wall clock time. And every other node on the network, uh, it tries to spoof the median clock time to be 70 minutes ahead of the wall clock time. So if we assume now that the target node has the internal time set 70 minutes behind the system time, uh, and every other node 70 minutes up ahead of time, um, we can actually go ahead and launch what's called the actual time jacking attack. Um, and we generally assume the attacker has a decent amount of hash power, like 10 or 20%, uh, in order to be able to mount this. Um, so once the uh, target nodes have, been, have had their internal clock times modified, the attacker mines a new block with a timestamp set 190 minutes ahead of the real time. And so this is key because this essentially means that every other node accepts the uh, new block because it's within their 120 minute or two hour uh, validation frame. However, the target node, because it's 70 minutes behind, actually considers the new block to be invalid. What this has essentially done is partition the network so the target node is actually on a separate, for now, uh, for basically 70 minutes, on a separate fork from the rest of the, net, rest of the network. Because the rest of the network is mining on this uh, essentially like modified block time, uh, whereas the target node is partitioned and doesn't consider any of those new blocks to be valid. So, um, oh. I need some to refresh. Hold on. Uh, Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so now that the blocks, or the target node is now partitioned from the network, uh, the attacker, you know, assuming they can maintain this time jacking attack and keep mining these uh, maliciously timed blocks, the attacker actually has. Uh, an indefinite amount of time to mine blocks in secret, to mine a longer chain that they can then broadcast to the target node, who then decides that, oh, this is an alternate chain of history, and then sends the goods along. Meanwhile, the attacker's actually received the goods and doesn't actually spend any money. Um, of course, uh, it's actually really, it's quite difficult to maintain the time jacking attack, because you have to keep mining these forward time blocks, uh, and then at the same time running a Sybil attack with your like full node uh, spoofs to like maintain the median like clock time modification. Uh, but even so, this basically gives you 70 minutes of free mining time if you're trying to launch a double spend attack. Um, so 70 minutes if you have like 20 or 30% of the hash power is a pretty good amount of time, especially if the target node is trying to do like a, a three or four confirmation um, it's like a three or four, four confirmation merchant, for example. Um, so it actually turns out that malicious miners can also time jack other competing miners. 
And this kind of works in the same way as like a general denial of service attack, uh, where a malicious miner actually uh, launches a denial of service attack against other miners. And if you can effectively shut down other miners, they aren't mining on the network anymore. So the malicious miner has a greater uh, effective hash power, if that makes sense. So you know, if you're a miner with the access to like a giant distributed botnet, then uh, you actually have a really good competitive adva advantage. So um, I don't know if this has actually happened in practice, but it seems to me like it would be feasible to like rent out a botnet and like denial of service attack other miners because it gives you much greater hash power. Um, so uh, also, I wanted to talk about yeah. Um, well, presumably you have like a list of, I don't know, IP addresses or something that you control and you wouldn't okay. like ping spam them or something. Okay. <laughs> um, that is actually a good question because it's not always a given that you know uh, the IP addresses of like all the other nodes in the network. You usually only know like a select subset, for example. Um, so I just want to talk about one more interesting uh, attack or actually property of Bitcoin transactions, and that's called transaction malleability. Um, so it turns out that when you broadcast a fresh transaction, um, there are actually certain fields in the transaction that you can change that will actually still validate with the same signature. Um, even though once you've like taken the hash of this modified transaction, it's actually a different hash value. And so this is really important. Um, or I guess uh, as an example, for ECDSA, if you take the, uh, in the RS signature pair, if you take the negative signature mod n, it's actually the same as the S mod n. Um, so a full node on the network who sees your fresh transaction can actually like, negate your signature, uh, your S in the signature pair. And it would actually still verify um, in the ECDSA digital signature scheme, uh, but it's actually a different like transaction that the hash is different. Uh, actually, an additional thing uh, you can actually tack on like a extra script sig ops that don't affect the behavior of the transaction, but again change the contents of the transaction and therefore change the hash value. And so this seems kind of like subtle and not useful, but it's actually important for uh, several protocols that rely on chain transactions. So for example, uh, microtransactions, or in the scalability lecture, we'll talk about uh, the Lightning Network, actually require these uh, hash chains to be valid. And so if you can change one of the intermediate transactions, uh, the hash value changes, and then the entire hash change, the hash chain changes. And so it invalidates the entire chain, and it basically messes up the uh, behavior. And so there's actually uh, an example incident of this occurring uh, with Mt. Gox, where an attacker uh, basically withdrew funds from Mt. Gox. Uh, the attacker had some full nodes that he controlled. And upon seeing the broadcasted transaction from Mt. Gox, actually changed the script sig to be like the negative script sig. Um, and then that modified transaction actually got precedence and was you know, added to the blockchain. Meanwhile, the transaction hash changed. So Mt. Gox, because they were relying on the transaction has to say the hash to stay the, the same, um, actually was like, oh, this transaction didn't happen. So they didn't deduct the funds from the person's account. And so the attacker basically got free Bitcoin from Mt. Gox. And so uh, just some solutions that people have come up with are, for example, uh, segregated witness which we'll talk about again in this uh, scalability lecture, uh, which actually stores the signatures in a separate Merkle tree. And so that essentially fixes the signatures because you can't change the signatures because they'll change the Merkle root and invalidate the whole Merkle tree. Um, so that, those are the network attacks. And we we'll go back to the max. You can talk about game theory lemmas. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so um, in this section, I'm going to try to generalize uh, some of the vulnerabilities that I was talking about uh, previously with the mining strategies. 
So we're gonna build up uh, a theorem uh, one by one, piece by piece. So if you accept this notion that uh, computational power requires electricity, um, and electricity costs money, uh, kind of like the question that I answered earlier, um, the, the market is operating at near perfect competition, which is basically like, okay, the amount of money that is being created in Bitcoin, basically the block reward, uh, is equal to the amount of money that's being expended to get that block reward, because it's, mining is a very competitive process. So you can establish this lemma that the mining reward is equal to the mining cost. Now if you have <laughs> really efficient hardware, and you're roughly breaking even with the capital that you invest, there's almost little, you know, very little uh, marginal uh, cost to getting more hash rate. You know, if you have really efficient hardware, there's actually a negative marginal cost to getting hash rate. So then, all it takes to get 51% of the hash rate is a lot of capital. Um, so that means the cost of acquiring 51% is around zero or even negative, um, which is less than the mining cost. <clears throat> so let's analyze what you can do with you know, getting 51% of the hash rate. You can, for example, you can do a bunch of double spans and you can crash the currency. You can regain this value using the gold finger tack, as you may recall, by uh, shorting Bitcoin provided that there is enough liquidity and recoup your investment. Um, another thing you can do with 51% of the hash rate is you get 100% of the mining reward instead of, you know, like 60% or whatever that you have. Because you can, you can just only mine on your own blocks and whenever someone else tries to mine on your blocks, you just continue mining on your own blocks and you basically orphan every other block in the network. And it's interesting because uh, how would this affect the user experience of Bitcoin? If you have, um, if you have 51% of hash rate, you know, 49% of the blocks are orphaned, but if you have 80% of the hash rate, only 20% of the blocks are orphaned. So to an average user, it's not really affected. They're still able to make transactions, use the Bitcoin financial system. They don't care that you have 80% of the hash rate. Um, so in this third lemma, we established that the value of a 51% attack is greater than the mining reward because you can, you know, do things like 100% of the mining reward or, uh, or conduct a gold finger attack on the currency. So combining these lemmas together, uh, you can see that, okay, the mining reward is equal to the mining cost. So substituting that into lemma two, the cost of acquiring 51% is less than the mining reward. Uh, and substituting that into lemma three, you get that the value of a 51% attack is greater than the cost of acquiring 51%. So if you accept this math, uh, this argument that I just made, the game theory says that it is literally profitable to 51% attack Bitcoin which is a huge problem, right? This is like the underlying assumption of Bitcoin. Uh, and to be profitable, like what's stopping someone from doing this? So uh, <laughs> some more additional ideas. Um, how, there's a lot of pool wars going on. How can you, uh, like, how can you kind of offset the cost? Uh, one thing you, that you can do is you can uh, set up an insurance contract for these Bitcoin stakeholders that is based off of the number of orphan blocks that are detected. That's because you know, orphan blocks are kind of a sign of pool wars, a sign that someone's being excluded somewhat. And in general, uh, Bitcoin mining is zero sum because in order to increase your own earnings past your fair share, you need to exclude someone else and basically waste their time mining. So one scheme for doing this is you can say, okay, let, uh, let a bunch of miners uh, join this collusion until you have 80% of the network in this collusion and at that point just exclude everyone else in the network like only mine on the blocks produced produced by this collusion and from a game theoretical standpoint there's no incentive not to join because if the attack succeeds you get increased rewards and um, the attack wouldn't fail uh, you could just conduct the attack in such a way that you're only going to start excluding the other members um, once you've actually reached this threshold so game theory says that this would always happen. Uh, in a more naive example, um, you could say have three pools collude uh, and they collectively own more than 51%. Um, this is like very possible in today's uh, mining ecosystem. And they simply just ignore the 10th block of every other pool. Um, the problem with this is, remember, as because these 
Bitcoin mining clocks uh, are every 10 minutes. Uh, it's very hard to create some kind of statistically uh, st uh, significant change. So this is basically undetectable, and it would be more profitable than the honest strategy. So the really scary thought is that how much of this is actually going on today, and we don't even know about it. <clears throat> so I just wanted to make a few more comments on post-block reward Bitcoin. Uh, so as you may recall, the, the block reward halves every four years, and uh, the total amount of Bitcoin will be mined uh, by the year uh, 2140. Uh, so let's, let's make a really optimistic assumption for this model. Let's say that, okay, the average Bitcoin user holds you know, uh, $10,000 in Bitcoin, and they really optimistically, exorbitantly pay $1,000 in fees. So is, we want to ask the question, is mining based off of transaction fees sustainable? Because you need to move this money so that uh, transactions can be paid so that these miners will be incentivized to contribute their computational power and collect it as a mining reward. Because remember, you know, this amount of hash power is dependent on the total amount of mining reward. So you can take this ratio of an average, really optimistic average user paying $1,000 in fees per their $100,000 in Bitcoin uh, and set that equal to the, the cost of attacking, basically the amount of security being invested into the network over the market cap of Bitcoin. And from that proportion, you deduce that the attacker only needs to pay 1% of the market cap of Bitcoin to attack the network, which is extremely scary. Um, it, it's basically saying that you know, Bitcoin needs to have a really high 